can i have your attention please well the speaker of the day is uh, victoria uh, who is also a friend i'll request chairman to please uh, welcome her introduce victoria to all of you um though i think she is already becoming very famous in this country promoting her book uh, <laughs> um uh, she is a journalist though she claims that she is not an expert but she has uh, years of experience working in smithsonian with a masters of, of art uh, degree uh, she is basically a journalist as we call but maybe with a g <laughs> because uh, generally journalists are experts of everything and one of the things that is very uh, close to her hearts have been the step wells in fact one day she walked into my office and demanded what is intact doing to conserve uh, these uh, step wells which are so unique and thankfully we were working on a few of them in uh, bundi and we were making a book but over over so many years that we have been in discussion our interest has also grown a lot in uh, those step wells and then she's recently published a book on very aptly uh, aptly titled the vanishing step wells every day that i travel we see some of these getting lost or about to be lost or filled up uh, very recent examples in gurgaon so without taking much time i would request victoria to please enlighten us with her talk and all the step well she has found all over the country so thank you very much thank you uh, i would not be standing here if it were not for dive am i allowed to move this again cuz i'm so choti and this is so bara how's that did you impressed by my hindi uh it's harab hai and that's about all i know so i mean literally what 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 divid just said is true that i walked into his office i don't know anybody i'm not affiliated with any institution i was doing this on my own and uh he was so patient and kind with me i have to say unlike the people at asi who like wouldn't give me the time of day so i'm very very grateful to intock i talk about intock all the time divid's name is on the cover of the book which should be here i just want to show you before i get started cuz i'll i'll forget this otherwise that um i am a journalist i'm not a historian i'm not a scholar and i'm not even a photographer when i started this 6 years ago uh i was just going around taking pictures because i thought these were fascinating more on that in a minute here's the camera i used It's very inexpensive Sony. It's set on automatic. If it ever goes off automatic by accident, I panic. So, the fact that this got turned into this beautiful book, I just I'm really impressed with myself. I would never ever have imagined it in a thousand years, nor that I would be standing here with a book with Dive's name on it. People ask me where this all began and uh It, and and I have to just say here that I've altered this talk from the ones that I've done pretty much everywhere which were much more general conversations because I know that this is a much higher level of uh preservation interest so I'm not going to go into as much of the here's what a step well does here's what it looks like in diagram if you have any questions you can ask me or anybody from Intoc really afterwards uh 30 plus years ago on my first trip to india i was in ahmedabad and one of the things that i did when i was there was being taken to this place a lot of you will recognize it i'm sure uh there was no grass there was no trees there was no radio tower then but looking over that wall was a completely unexpected experience that basically has changed the trajectory of my life 
The last thing you expect looking over a wall, even a wall that's, that's so plain, is that the ground just drops away in front of you. Uh, we are conditioned to look up at architecture, not down into it. And so that moment of just shock and awe, seeing this chasm with a parade of columns uh, that I couldn't even tell how deep it was, how far it went, that was a transformative moment for me, but it got better. Because going into this, and it's the Rue de uh, I'm again, I'm sure a lot of you, if you've been to uh, uh, Gujarat, you really can't miss this outside of Ahmedabad. The experience of going into this well and many step wells, one of the reasons I became completely obsessed is that unlike any other form of architecture that I'm aware of, it actually transforms you as you go down into the earth. Just going down into the earth is a powerful experience. And at the same time, your senses become enhanced. In this case, uh, the Gujarat air is very hot, and as you proceed down in this, you can feel the air cooling around you. And it's so bright in Gujarat, as you descend, it becomes murky, and the air is very diffuse. The sounds above ground, which are so loud, honking, screaming, they become very hushed the lower down you get. And so by the time you get to the bottom, you have really gone through the steps into another world. And you know, there's the top. You're down six stories at that point, five, but six if you count the well. The other thing is that the views are constantly shifting. The whole experience is incredibly disorienting. Now, you know, step wells are known first uh, primarily for their water harvesting capabilities. Is this, can everybody hear me okay? It's fine, okay. I thought she was about to complain. That's what they did every day of the year in places where it was very difficult to get water. So that was their primary purpose for being. But they had so many other functions, more than any other structure at their time, so that they were, um, they became such extraordinary multifunctional buildings that people think of in terms of water harvesting, but goes so far beyond that. Uh, the Hindu ones were uh, used as temples. Even some of the Islamic ones you still see uh, in some of the, uh, the niches and alcoves that people are still making pujas there. They were very important social centers, particularly for women who, that's their job, always going to get the water. And the idea of getting to go with your friends and meeting in down in the well, that would have been a very important thing for a woman at that time. They were very important charitable gifts to the community by uh, wealthy people, by uh, royal patrons. Obviously, they were very expensive to give, but it was also an incredible act of generosity to do so. You were considered a benevolent ruler, a benevolent member of the community. 25% of step wells are believed to have been constructed by women in honor of their dead husbands or just to give back to the community. This is just two examples. Um, that is Raniji, uh, Rani Kibali, sorry, I'm getting these wrong, Murtaniji Kibali on the left. Usually I have these um, labeled. Uh, that's in Shakavati in Junjunu. And the one on the right, I'm actually stepping on my tiptoes. Isn't that funny? God, I'm shrimpy. Um, the one on the right is Rani Bauli, and that's in, uh, in Nadal in Pali. But they were also extremely important out in the hinterlands on the trade routes where you really needed to have a rest stop periodically where you could count on the water. This one is outside of Donk and this wonderful uh, goat herder took pity on me, he heard me lamenting the fact that I couldn't find various step wells around there and literally took off running into the underbrush so that I could get to this particular well. Another compelling reason for me to start uh, wh why my obsession began is that I realized that I had been within feet of so many of these over the many years that I was coming to India and never saw one after that first one, that they are literally hiding in plain sight, that so many of them are right on the grounds of tourist locations that every tourist you know has gone to see. Uh, and the idea that we could just shift our perspective a tiny bit 
and see these marvels. And it really annoyed me. It still annoys me. And one that I'm sure a lot of you know. I'm going to keep, I should just not say that. Some of you might not know about this. But anyway, the Red Fort, Bowley. This is one that it, there is a little sign with an arrow, but you wouldn't necessarily find it. It's off by the original barracks. And if you are not paying attention, this is a great example of hiding in plain sight. You would literally fall into it. it then look at that. You could be looking up. Oh, there's an airplane splat. You go right on your face. It's a beautiful step well in any case. It's often locked. It's hard to get in. But uh, it's the only step well in Delhi that's got these two separate entrances. It's quite beautiful. And you probably know that it was used by the uh, British Army to house, uh, to jail freedom fighters. And when you go, some of these alcoves are uh, kind of bricked up. And you can still see the, um, the, the bars. So. This is one that everybody knows, but it's another example of hiding in plain sight. And to a certain extent, how um, stepwell awareness has changed to a, to a limited degree, but it's happening. This is uh, right off Haley Road, very close to Connaught Place. I know people that grew up on this street and had no idea what they were missing. They never went in and looked at what was on the other side of that wall. And of course, it's Agra Shenkibali, which used to have nobody in it when I went. I mean, that's what it would look like. I was amazed there were two people there. This is, I don't know, six years ago. And now, because of PK and Amir Khan, it's always filled with people and canoodling couples. And you know, it's great. It's being used again. They've never been there in their life. And you're probably familiar with this uh, Raghu Rai photograph. Um, no, that's, that's, that's Agra Sen before it was restored. Look at the water in there. It's just incredible. Yeah, well, you know the statistic. At least this was true when I was first doing this, that uh, the water in Delhi at the time that that was taken in the 70s was about 27. The average was about 27 meters, I think, below the surface. Or maybe it was 27 feet. But anyway, it was pretty close. And now it's something like 200, thanks to all the bore wells. So you know, it's an interesting statistic. I'm going to show a couple now that maybe you're familiar with, maybe you're not. But again, if people just shifted their focus slightly, they could go and see some of these extraordinary marvels that um, really aren't focused on in any guidebook. A lot of guides don't even know where these are. I'm constantly showing them, for instance, how to get to Rajon Kibauli. They like, have no idea that's even there. This is um, at Fatapur Sikri. If you go out the back way, the Elephant Gate, and, you know, nobody goes that way. But it's a really complicated, fascinating step well. And um, was, anyway, it's a very complicated water hauling system. But it's a beautiful well that is hiding in plain sight. This one, too, in Edar, I drove back and forth for like an hour trying to find that. I mean, you would never know that it was there unless you were really looking hard for it. It's got such a little presence above ground. And this is what it looks like below ground. People are actually still using this in some of the, uh, they're going down there and doing prayers in some of the niches. But this is very typical government protection sign. You can see how well protected it is. I mean, they're comical. This one looks like somebody was shooting at it. And this is 14th century. So I've seen 200 step wells, maybe even more now, because uh, I just saw a bunch this last week, all over India. And that's just a tiny fraction. There's thousands out there, thousands. And I wasn't even that organized about it, which is why there's not a map in the book, because so many that I saw were really in Haryana, Rajasthan, Gujarat, but they're all over the place. And the, um, the, the array is just astounding. They're not all, none of them are alike. No two are alike. They're like fingerprints. Uh, the one on the left is from Buj. Very small and intimate, and of course, Rani Kival, most of us recognize that, the biggest monster of all. They can be incredibly simple, just so beautiful and refined and utilitarian, and then, of course, incredibly ornate. They run the gamut in all points in between. Now, while most of them are linear, relentlessly linear, and the one on the left, it's just, you know, it's like you're looking down this train tunnel, basically. There are so many other forms, which 
You may have seen L-shaped forms come up again and again, many round versions. Uh, the Bundy book, the Bundy book I'm always selling for you at Intalk, I'm telling people about it, and the one on the left for any of you that have seen it, and if you haven't, you should buy it because it's a fantastic book. Uh, the square ones you see, and they're always usually pretty eccentric, usually pretty eccentric. The one on the right is in Farukh Nagar, I'm sure you've seen that. One of the few octagonal ones that I've seen, that's not such a common shape. But you know, the other form is of course kunz, which is another form of step well, but it's defined by that funnel shape and those just mesmerizing stairs. Uh, Chan Bowdy, we are, this is another one that it just goes, drives me nuts, the tourists don't see this. It's like 15 minutes off the road. And when I show, I do a lecture uh, in, 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 Cal, in, where do I live? In the United States about um, tourist places in India the tourists never see, but if they just tweaked their trip, five minutes, they could see something wonderful. Whenever I show this and people find out they've missed it, they literally, like, cry. They can't believe it, and they should. And I've just been able to get it on at least one tour itinerary with Ventours because they've heard me yammering about these forever, but they're not on itineraries. I wanna change that. All of you are going to be changing that. Anyway, this is one of the most interesting ones because it was started around 800 by a, uh, a Hindu ruler, and then there was this uh, much later Islamic structure slammed into it, and it's just the way it cascades down that side. I love this. It's wonderful. Although, uh, when I first went there, there weren't any of these <laughs> fences because now some tourists died because, and I'm sure there were plenty of women and priests who died too if they dredged that bottom. I'm sure there'd be bombs. Uh, kunds happen all over the place. There are some regional differences to other things, but a kund is basically defined by the shape and those stairs. So even though one's in Gujarat, one's in Rajasthan, these are about from the same period, around 800, you can see there's very little difference stylistically, but you just cannot take a bad picture of a kund, and that's why I like showing them. There's no other reason for me to show you this, but they're just so beautiful. You can be a lousy photographer and people will love you for your kund picture. And the most interesting one to me is in Varanasi, and. Uh, now, Devi, I heard that you've started to do this too, showing that picture, which uh, Lolar Kund is, uh, is very, very mysterious, not just because of the shape, but because all of the information about it is shrouded in myth, and there is no date that can be assigned to it. One of the problems with doing step well research and why I did not want to do this book is because you cannot pin down almost any information, and when you do, when you get a date, like at Rani Kivau and you know who built it, Queen Udayamati, why she did it, King Bimdev, all of these things, um, that is the rarest gift, because 99% of them, you don't know anything, date, commission, anything, and this is one of those. But what I was saying about um, these still being used for uh, important ritual uh, religious festivals once a year, this, uh, you all know it's a low lark, what's the name of, during the monsoon, but women, thousands, thousands of couples go to the Kund uh, to dip in the water, and if you go on YouTube and see a video of this, this eight minute video, and you look at the mounds of clothes that are left behind after you dip, you take off your clothes, you put on other ones, and it's just a massive cleanup effort. Okay, this is from Bundy too, but look at that. I mean, they're just extraordinary. But as I've been doing this and seeing so many of these and trying to figure out what the different categories are, one of the interesting ones is that the eccentric step well, they really don't fit into any definition. They're not linear, they might be square, but are they a kund, are they a step well? I just happen to really like these. Uh, and this one at the uh, Mandu Fort is one of my favorites. It's just, but that's what it looks like from one angle, and you think it's a kund. And then there's all these other crazy ways to get into it. And then there's this structure off to the side. This is just 
I mean, it's almost schizophrenic for a step well. You just don't see anything like this. It's very unusual, but quite beautiful off to the side where no tourist will ever see it. Another one that's in Jodhpur, this one is going to be restored. I just talked to a, a conservation architect there. I kind of like it like this, but it, it's just a very odd structure, the, kind of like Pradhanji, which I just showed you. Another thing that's really odd about it is that even though it's been a Hindu structure since it was built, and there's a lot of these uh, Hindu statues around, it also has now um, a, a, a Muslim uh, grave somehow. People are going there. It's, uh, it, it's, it's kind of inexplicable. Nobody's been able to tell me, but you can see how there's all these different ways to enter it. Another really eccentric one that I love, and I don't know anybody that's seen this, Chalibai, which is at the base of uh, Chittorgarh Fort. And it's just, again, it's just somebody made these design decisions that there is no reason to have this go up like that. It's just something that was decided from a stylistic standpoint. It's also a fascinating one because you can see in the walls around it how just fragments of Hindu monuments were um, embedded in the walls, which you see in a lot of other places. Now, stylistically, I have begun to see some regional styles, uh, but they're very subtle for the most part. This is one of my favorite step wells. It's uh, in Madhya Pradesh, in the middle of nowhere. I hesitated to put this in the book because there's a family living there who has had the land deeded to them for centuries. These Bundela um, step wells, I mean, you would never imagine there was a step well on the other side of that, but it is just extraordinary. It's functioning still with water uh, in that they, they use it for uh, irrigation, and the, the woman, the mom there, she's always washing clothes in it. But this style, it's just the most beautiful thing. This weird style of you go down the stairs and then there's a bridge and then there's like this flat area. And the ones, in, uh, the ones that I've seen in Madhya Pradesh are always up on these platforms. Like this one, again, they've got this really kind of muscular entrance for want of a better word. I mean, they are saying, here I am, you can't miss this thing. You may not know what it is because it doesn't really look like a step well. This, too, is a protected monument sign. I love these, because those are usually the ones that are just trashed. It, it's just unbelievable. I, I was going to do a whole section of trashed monument signs. Actually, I do have some, come to think of it. You're going to get a treat later. It's in pretty good shape, and this fellow is taking care of it. You know, that's not really allowed either, but I think it's good that he's there. <clears throat> I was in Telangana last year uh, in Hyderabad where there's a huge number of step wells and they're really working hard to, uh, they're, they're uh, making a list of all of them. There's something like 150 in the area. A lot of cities, Ahmedabad too, are going to great lengths to start documenting these. It's fantastic. But they have a very eccentric shape too. Usually you see a step well and it's very symmetrical. It makes a lot of visual sense, but these eccentric ones where you go down on the side and it, it's just a, I, they're fascinating to me. Of course, this one's trashed, but it's really interesting. Nobody knows the date, but it, it had these sculptures carved into it, you know, and centuries of painting over it. Another one, Malakabai Chan tomb. Uh, there are two of these. Then you can see, you know, they're just weird. It's just a very odd way of getting in. And one that's been fully restored, it just opened, the fantastic, uh, uh, oh my gosh, what is the trust? Come on, help me, I'm old. Yes, thank you, Aga Khan, they're doing such incredible work. And so this one, uh, this one has just been fully restored and it's beautiful. Now they started, Stepwells began as just very simple, basically stone excavated, things. There was nothing structural. They just dug into the rock. These are not that old. These are, um, this is just to show you what it looked like and how tough it must have been, both from uh, Gujarat, Junagadh. But these are much later. They think it was between the third and fifth century. Nobody really knows. It hasn't been established. But they do seem to have the oldest ones in Gujarat. And in fact, the oldest structural ones that have been found so far are in rural donk. 
these were probably at the time along these um, you know trade routes and it was really hard to find this donk is a very small town but it just goes to show you how much like background noise these have become like the you know nobody really notices they couldn't tell me where this was and it was in the middle of the town uh, that's where I met that wonderful shepherd <coughs> You can see the difference, like what, it's so tentative. It's really narrow. You can see it's, you know, they're, they're, it's almost, you can feel the fear of the walls collapsing. Building into the ground structurally is much harder than building up the stresses. As you go further and further down to keep the earth from collapsing, that's difficult to do. But even then, even in these early ones, they're still associated with aspects of the goddess. They were always, always, associated with something spiritual, some aspect of the goddess. You would see other deities, but that was first and foremost. Another one of these, there's several of these very early step wells, and all I can tell you is America is a new country, and the oldest thing we've got is this mud house in Santa Fe, New Mexico, from roughly 1600, and we worship that thing. So the idea, it's like, oh my God, let's go see the oldest house, and it's like this hideous hovel. And so the idea that it's this thing from 600, it's got tractors around it, it's just, okay, but more on that later, because I have a theory about this that you're not gonna like. Um, this is a transition to something next, which is what happens in Gujarat, because Gujarat is where all of the Hindu, uh, the really ornate Hindu step wells have survived. They really don't survive like that anywhere else. Um, and this is the complex at Rhoda, which is still, you see people are going there. Um, but then within a couple of years, you got Rani Kival, which is arguably the most grandiose, kind of bloated thing ever. It, it's incredible to me, but it doesn't feel like a step well. It's missing so many parts that it's hard to get the sense of what a step well actually is. Uh, and you probably know, or let me tell you again, that it's, according to Kirat Mankodi, who is the, the authority on this, um, it took about 25 years to build this. Queen Udayamati, in, uh, to honor her husband, and yet, even though they were you know, shoring this thing up everywhere you could, like huge amount of buttressing, what they couldn't guarantee was that the river, the source of the water nearby, it changed course, who would know that? And so the river, sometime after it was completed, Mancodi thinks within 100 years, the water broke through, collapsed um, one of the walls, and it was buried you know, for basically a thousand years, almost. This is how it looked when the British found it. And, um, you know, these stumpy columns and only this one part of the wellhead, uh, they began to excavate it. And it was like finding uh, Pompeii, you know, finding something that was just preserved for a millennium in the dirt. It would not, it probably would have been destroyed otherwise. I mean, in that nothing would be left. I want to say something, since I pointed out Kirat Minkoti, and I always, I need to get this in. Because I'm not a scholar, because I wasn't doing original research other than running around and asking people stuff and whatever, I wasn't contributing really to the scholarship, I don't think. What I was doing was synthesizing the important scholarly work of other people. There's three. And I like to always give them credit. Yuta J. Neubauer is one. She lives here in Delhi. She was incredibly supportive. I was hounding her all the time, like I was Dive. She was, you know, in incredibly patient about it. At a time when I didn't even know that I was going to be writing a book, she's one of the first people I credit because her work, the seminal work, um, Stepwells of Gujarat, which was her doctoral thesis and written 30 years ago and is out of print now. Um, that really set the tone for further scholarship. Also, Yuta J. New, I mean, I'm sorry, Morn Livingston, you might be familiar with her book, Steps to Water, also out of print, very scholarly, beautiful tome, but that it doesn't 
kind of speak the way I do, which is at a, a much lower bar that everybody can understand. It's a beautiful book, incredibly well researched, and she too was very accommodating for me. And then if you're really interested in water architecture, the doctoral thesis of, um, oh my goodness, oh it's horrible being old, Purani Videsi, Julia Hegewald, she wrote a book called uh, Water Architecture in South Asia, and there's a whole chapter on step wells. It's just incredible. They're so informative, and I could not be here without them. So I just wanted to put that out there. Okay, so Rani Kibao was there for all that time. The, some of the bones of it were exposed. There were columns. There was no stone in Patan. All the stone had to be brought from 140 kilometers away. <coughs> Some of it ended up here. The man who allegedly owned the property that Rani Kibao was on was Bahadur Singh, and he decided to build a step well close by. It's five kilometers from Rani. And when you go into it, it's actually an extraordinary place. This gives you that same sense almost of what, uh, what I felt at Rudabai Val, descending into the earth, the air, the, everything changing around you. It's very narrow, it's very intimate, and this is what Rani Kibau may have felt like when it was fully operational. But this is basically Rani Kibau stuffed into a 19th century box. Um, all of this, for the most part, was pilfered from Rani Kibau. And you can even see where Mr. Singh decided to like just prop up some of these, he added bits and pieces to, you know, give, because the, the heights change really dramatically as you're going down into a well. So he just added what he wanted, but it's, it's very beautiful. It's just not, it's ersatz, it's not quite real. And here's another one I just love to show. You're seeing a lot of pictures I never ever show with these, but they're not in the book. Oh, some of them are, but I'm just showing you in a very different way. I love this because it's, it's so dumb. I mean, this too, this is very, very late for a step well, 1860, but the fellow built this to water his grounds. There's still a park around it. I read recently that it too had been restored. But a lot of the pieces in this were just taken from all over the place. And when you look at Jetabai, I mean, just even the way these fit in there, it just doesn't, it just doesn't look right. And all of the stones on the side, they're all mixed and matched. It's a, anyway, I just had to throw that in because I never show it to anybody, and it's crazy. What happened, we've been looking at these Hindu wells, which are extraordinary. I mean, they're overwhelming in their detailed sculpture and the, the experience of them. But then, those are all pretty early, and when, uh, when the, uh, the Muslims came uh, to India, and particularly into Ahmedabad, which was founded you know, in the 15th century, Islam has incredible water structures. They revere water, and if you've been to, you know, Grenada or any of the incredible, anywhere basically, you see the, what am I talking about, the Taj Mahal, the water channels and fountains, and they're very water oriented, but they never had seen a step well. When they came to Gujarat and discovered these, that was a form that they adopted. And I have read that there is, uh, was an edict put out that even though temples were being destroyed, all these other uh, Hindu monuments were being destroyed, no one could touch a step well. They were revered. Now there's this wonderful moment, very short moment, uh, in and around Ahmedabad, where there's a complete kind of merger. If you watch Star Trek, it would I describe it as a transporter malfunction. This, this moment where things meld together, they were uh, built under Islamic rulers, but using Hindu craftsmen. And so unless you pay attention to them, you would think that these were Hindu monuments. But the difference is that um, Islam brought a lot of great stuff to India architecturally that wasn't here. Whereas India gave a lot of things to Islamic architecture that they didn't have. And Stepwells is one of them. But uh, before, before Muslims were here, all, um, all Hindu constructions were trabiate. They were post and lintel, they were flat. There was no true arch, there was no true dome. Everything was corbelled. So you wouldn't get something like, oops, you wouldn't get something like this, uh, this beautiful arch or the octagon. That was a specifically Islamic uh, motif. It's the octagon is used, the five pillars of Islam, very, very symbolic form. 
And also, even though you see all this beautiful decoration, um, the use of deities, of course, got less and less. There was an overlap at one point, but very quickly, you only got these beautiful floral and vegetal motifs, and then that dropped out too, because they're not allowed in Islam. What happened was, at least for this period, is that um, where you would have in these niches seen these beautiful sculptures, deities, apsaras, everything, you got these uh, kind of in-between forms that were reminiscent of them that might have been um, recognized, tree of life. They sort of went both ways to his Hindu and Muslims. Uh, but they were symbolic and abstract placed in these what were Hindu uh, niches. They're just extraordinary, beautiful moment that disappeared soon afterwards. Uh, Islam brought another form of stepwell to India that hadn't existed before. And this was what uh, we refer to as a retreat well, sometimes a spiral well. They were private wells used for wealthy, royal individuals in their gardens, in their backyards, in their fort. And just as all the other steppos were public monuments, they were very outward, everybody came to them, these are completely turned inward. You wouldn't even know they were there. This thing, I mean, this is in, uh, in Gujarat, and it's like a bunker. That's the only way I can describe it. You would have no idea what was under this thing. And even when you're going down these horrible steps, you have no idea. And then when you're in it, you realize the entire thing is the well shaft and water is drawn up from here. This was a place for women to come and be cool and, uh, and bathe where men couldn't see them. They were actually sequestered off in these rooms. They weren't rooms that had any light in them. And I hate to talk about this because I can still hear this moment when I got near it. And there's just this screeching of bats that is just you just can't even imagine. Bats just love these places. And it was one of the only places, actually the only place I can think of, that I could not go in to take a picture. I just thought of the flash going off and what was going to happen then, and I never went in. <laughs> and this is as close as I got. And even that looks really creepy. And I'd like to point out, too, that a lot of you, I hope, have gone to see steppos. Maybe you're obsessed in hunting them as I am. But this is not a pastime for people who are afraid of heights or depths or dark or bugs or bees or snakes, a mongoose. I mean, all of these things have kind of afflicted me, affected me. And it was really risky what I was doing, and I don't want to do it anymore. This is another one that's just incredible. Again, it looks like a subway grate or something that, I, this is off in the corner at, uh, the fort in Agra. You would never know about it. The fellow who was running Agra when I, when I got in to see it, that was thanks to Dr. Manny, who really was helpful at, a, uh, at the ASI, really opened doors for me six years ago. And this is so complicated, and you cannot see it. And this was for Akbar's. It's right by the palace wing. It is the most complex subterranean structure maybe ever. It, it's just, it goes down seven stories, six floors, and then the well at the bottom. There's two-story painted rooms. There are several sets of stairways that, that wind around, and then a whole separate one that was supposed to be for Akbar himself. It is just the most remarkable structure that you can't see. But again, the idea that something is just, you can't even tell what it's like from the outside. For some reason, I'm thinking of crustacean fish. Like, the party's on the inside, and it's being held into a shell, and you can't tell what's in there. So what happened? Of course, people want to know, well, why, why don't we know about them? I mean, to me, there's, the first answer is, we should know about them. The fact that they lost their usefulness really, to me, is inconsequential. How do you not know about this entire category of architecture that not only has such an important history, but is just from an architectural and engineering and art perspective among the greatest types of architecture in the world? And yet, I can't tell you the number of architects I've spoken mm -hmm. to, even in India, that just have never seen or even heard of one. I have gone through so, anyway, I'm ranting, never mind. Um, <laughs> 
<laughs> like talking about Trump. I just can't stop once I get started. And that's pretty bad too, really bad. That's worse. So the British, the, you know, I, I hate putting the blame on the British entirely because that's not really true. It really, somebody just misquoted me and I just said, yeah, the British did that. The British contributed to it, but the British are not responsible for the fact that Stepwells fell off the map. That is due to a lot of other things. The British may have gotten the ball rolling in certain ways, but it would have happened eventually anyway, because even though they hated them, they thought they were nasty, disease producing, you know, closed them down, filled them up. The British also brought progress. There were hand pumps in villages. There were storage tanks. Uh, there's plumbing. Those things would have come whether it was the British who brought them or not. And of course, if you had a choice between walking down 150 stairs or going to the village pump, then that's what you were going to do, go to the pump. Um, once, <laughs> that's a very pretty ring you have. <laughs> Once these structures were untethered, unmoored from their original purpose, that was the beginning of the end. Once they did not serve their original purpose of providing water, it became less and less important to maintain them. Even when they're protected, even when they're still temples, even when they're still used in a number of ways, which they still are, that was when step wells began to die. And there are a lot of other things that happened. For instance, the world grew around them. So many, <laughs> this is great. This is one of my favorite step wells. It was so hard for me to find for the GPS coordinates that I hired somebody from Ahmedabad to go and find it for me. Because I spent hours and hours looking at it on Google Earth. But when it looks like this, sandwiched between these structures that are literally built on top of it. There were three entrances I could see at one point. I mean, it was a very simple well, but it's really an extraordinary one. Bricks are being taken away. This is a protected site. <laughs> I hate to think what it would look like if it wasn't protected. I mean, what could happen to this? It's very beautiful with these weeds hanging off of it, but you know, it's just, it's just in such, I mean, these are ones that make me cry because they're just, they were so extraordinary. Um, this is another one, a protected one, uh, that is really remarkable for certain things. Like, even though this is impossible almost to see because of its exposure, it's like a patchwork quilt of different beautifully um, carved um, design motifs. It still functions, not completely as a temple, but important shrine. Uh, and yet this is how it's taken care of on the inside. And this is what it looks like. I had to literally knock on doors, go through people's living room, finally up to the roof, to get a view of what it looks like. Very distinctive roofs in that part of Gujarat because it's completely encroached. And you can see how the town literally grew up and absorbed it. I have to say too that I have had to go onto a lot of roofs, hanging out people's windows, knocking on strangers' doors. I would never do this in the United States. Everybody accepted me. I mean, they thought I was Pavel crazy, and, but they let me in. They said, sure, come in, very welcoming, stay and have tea. If you tried this in America, you would be shot. They would call the police after they shot you. <laughs> would never happen. Another one that's just, it's so beautiful, and it's, it's not protected, but it's not like it makes a difference in this case. This also is in Kapitvanj, buried in the midst of these, this, again, I had to get up on a roof to get a view. And this is supposed to have the most number of these niches uh, of any steple. It's also got an incredible torrent that is just, it's leaning backwards. Like that is, that you guys should get on this like fast and move that. It's supposed to be the most beautiful one in Gujarat. It's, Oh, God. Okay, one of, the, one of the most interesting ways of being encroached is this step well that I was trying to find in the Umayyad uh, Gardens in Jodhpur. I'd read about it from some like footnote somewhere. 
and it's encroached by the zoo. And I had to beg my way in and then basically kick geese out of the way because it was right next to the goose enclosure. And <laughs> it was really funny, but it was also terrible because this is just the most beautiful thing. I just, again, they're doing so much uh, progressive work in Jodhpur. This is on their list to conserve. And the zoo apparently was closed down, so you don't have to step over geese anymore. Although that was fun. I like that. So I go back to these step wells periodically. Um, and this is what's happening in 99% of them, even though, yes, there's great progress. But there's so much more that needs to be done. And Narnal has some fantastic valleys, as you know, because Intoc also did that book. I mean, I don't know where I'd be without Intoc. I have to hand it to you folks. You've done the most important work in this area that I've ever seen, except for these scholars. So these were two pictures I took separated by three years. Mukunpura Valley. I don't think I have the exterior here. Another one very close by that I just used to think was jaunty and fun. Somebody like kept it up. I just liked the way it looked and now it's like this malevolent ghost, you know, like get back. I really don't like it anymore. Um, this is really one of my favorite government protected ones. Very important. It's got you know, these unique brackets to haul the water up. And yet, somebody built an office on top of it because it's a, it's, a, uh, it's a nursery for plants. And they just thought that'd be a good place. I don't know. It's like, really? OK, so we go from that to that. Extraordinary. Sometimes it's not, um, there's other types of intervention than a planned one like that. This is actual human intervention. This is, oh, I don't have the sign up there, Sarai Babdi. Uh, this is in Amer. And in 2008, the, there was a kind of public private uh, effort between Hindustan Coca Cola, and they were restoring a number of steples and other structures. This was one of them. Uh, it is. 18th century probably, I don't know, I get different, nobody really knows. And they restored it and they were doing a great job, but they were, didn't use, they just, somebody wasn't thinking clearly. They either put the material in the wrong place, it was bad material, bad workmanship, and that's what happened, and there it sits. There's natural disasters, these were, you know, two different step wells in Gujarat that were really damaged, of course, by the, um, by the earthquake. The one on the left is Vikyavau, really important 13th century one. And then, you know, I just saw this last year. I'd never seen what one looked like silted up. This is about as extreme as you can get. I have no idea what this is, what it looks like underneath, but it would take a lot of um, effort to get rid of the silt. Now, here's what I've been thinking about, and we can argue about this at some point, because I've become sort of a, a renegade, I think. People get really angry about the government and the villagers. Why aren't they taking care of these? How Don't they realize this is heritage? And I realize that heritage, as important as it is to preserve heritage, and I'm like at the forefront of that idea, it's also a fantasy that is not cannot be fully realized in certain places. And if there is money to spend on something important, even the oldest step wells in India, in the middle of Donk where nobody goes and the local people have no idea they're there, then what is the point of restoring them? The only point is if you can reconnect them to something really important, th there's no value to, a, to heritage for these people. And I'm sure some of you will agree with that if you think of it. You cannot eat heritage. Heritage doesn't help you. If you're poor in a village trying to you know, keep your family together every day, what is the point of heritage? There's a point only if you can use it for something practical, whether that's restoring the water table or creating a you know, some other kind of function for it, then people will take care of it. But even as Intuck has discovered with their fantastic restoration in uh, Bundi, unless you get the community involved for all time, not just for a month or a year, forever, you may restore every step well in India and within two years, 90% of them will be back trashed. 
So I was looking at these pictures. Um, the one on the left, Mata Bhavani, has been a functioning temple. I mean, it stopped for a period because the government took it over and it was government protected. And then the people around it, as the, as the area grew, just said, forget it. It was a temple then and we need a temple. And so they took it over and that's how it looks. Now the government was talking about tearing all this stuff down and restoring it to what it looked like before. Why? Because then it will look like this incredible step on the right which is government protected in theory. And it's, that's not doing any good. I would much rather have people using a stipple and keeping it up for some purpose. So that on the left, I, I don't even know anything about this Bhairava, but it's gotta be an old step well, not as old as the one on the right. Uh, but the one on the right is falling apart. You know, people have parked park tractors around it. So is this bad? On the left, the people have fixed it up in a way that we may find repugnant as you know, people who are interested in heritage and conservation, but it's used every single day. It's beloved. It's part of the transition to a new life. The one on the left, this is an incredible step. Well, again, it's very close. You, know, you could go off. It, it's literally by the side of the road as you're going into Fatapur Sikri. It's the largest L-shaped steeple. It's gorgeous. It's huge, and it's built out of that red standstone of Fatapur Sikri, being used to um, irrigate. And I used to be mad, thinking, how can they put these pipes in this monument? It's fantastic. How can they do that? Well, they're using it. It's being used. That's an important thing. It was used for that, you know, centuries ago. And if any of you have been to Madurai, there's this. Um, you know, this area, the mandat that is, yeah, it's from the same period. It's like 16th century. It's an incredible area of sculpture. And well, it was unused for a long time. And now it's an incredibly thriving marketplace. Tailors sit there under this beautiful sculpture. How is that bad? It's being used. Another way of promoting step though, is when they are actually um, integrated into society. And by the way, I'm almost done. I don't even know how long I've been talking. Oh, it's not that long. Never mind, I'm not done. Um, Charles Correa, you know, used Stepwells famously as an inspiration for his work. Sanjay Puri, who uh, I think he's in, he has offices here, but he lives in uh, Mumbai. And he too has been incorporating Stepwell and the ideas of water into his work. This is unbuilt on the right. It was a reservoir in Rajasthan. But you can see Katanbali on the left, uh, obviously, where he's looking at stuff. Another way is to um, kind of adaptive reuse in another way of Stepwells. Think of a way of drawing people in that's exciting to them. Here's a perfect example. This is at the Ravlin Narle Hotel which is near Jodhpur. I think I drove there from Udaipur. It's a little, uh, I think it's like 17th century uh, hunting lodge that they've turned into a beautiful little hotel. And there's a gorgeous little step well on the property. And like once a week, they do dinner at the step well. And they take you in an ox cart, kind of hokey, but fun. And then you get there and it's all lit up and you're served and there's a man playing music. It's just like the most divine experience. And that is catching on. People want to go there to have this dinner. Brilliant. Let's do that in Rajon Kibali. Imagine going through Morali and then getting to Rajon and having dinner there, music. Oh, it'd be fantastic. There's other uses, other inspirations. I just met Anu Muridal. This guy's fantastic in Jodhpur. He's doing so much restoration architect in Jodhpur architecture. And this is a public private thing he did with the Maharaja. It's a fancy gated community. It's not a step well. It's a cistern that is harvesting water, gray water from the area. But he used these craftspeople that, I mean, you can see they just descended all the way down from all the other step wells that we've seen. It's quite wonderful. Oh, and this is, I don't know, people seem to like this. I just hate this thing. This is actually being built right now. I thought it would never get built in Manhattan, New York, my countrymen are doing this. Um, it's called Vessel. Uh, it is, it's like if you did a, a, a plastic cast of uh, pretty much any kund, it would look like this. That's it on the left. 
It actually looks like that. It's going up. I just saw it online. It's costing $164 million. I think people are just going to jump off of it and hit that. It's like a suicide magnet. And I just can't understand it. I think it's just disgraceful. OK, this is Bavaldi Bowery, which Intoc is doing. You've all seen that by the book. OK, here's my favorite thing. And this is an example of how you can rejuvenate a step well and rejuvenate a city and an area and become famous. Um, I don't know, five years ago, four years ago in Jodhpur, I was walking around. I knew this was a step well, but you couldn't see it. And it smelled. It was gross. There were things floating in it, including dead things. And the people that own it own Ross Hotel, this very stylish hotel back there. And they got sick of it being like that. All they knew was that it was from the early 1700s. Nobody had ever seen the bottom of it. And they decided to get rid of, you know, 300 years of garbage. They, 500 truckloads of garbage. I just was staying there and saw this. I had to go see it again. And today it looks like this. I love that moment. I tell the people there, every time I show that picture, there's, ah, in the audience. I just was there. There's people swimming in it. There's um, tourists hanging around. It's a, it's that whole, they call it Stepwell Square. There's all these little shops and restaurants that have opened. There's something called Stepwell Cafe, which is like up here. Uh, it's just been an incredible transformation. And yes, it's expensive. And actually, there's a horrible story about it. Wait, I'll show you. The government stepped in, local government, after they did all this work and said, you can't do that. Uh, you didn't go through us. You didn't get the correct things. And we're taking it over. And within a couple of weeks, they had, I have pictures of it. I didn't include it. Um, hammered no trespassing signs into this you know, 18th century rock stopped circulating the water. They sent me photographs of dead fish, hundreds of dead fish that had been swimming there quite happily. And it, it just, that's what happened when the government stepped in. Then the community said, no, we're taking this back over. And they've been cleaning it up. But it's still, the government is, has got their clamps on it. And it shows you that the government can actually make things way worse, way worse when they step in. This just appeared on the stamps, the Stepwell stamps, which, Dive, don't forget to give those to me. If you didn't know that, the post office just issued a sent, set of Stepwell stamps. I've been, there's 16 Stepwells, of which this is one. OK, so Bajrapur Valley, yeah, this is happening daily. These were pictures I took two or three years ago, I forget. Um, You've heard what's happening with that. Somebody was bulldozing the sides. They were going to make a road. Now I think that stopped in talk, Ansel University, a bunch of low. You made, people made a stink, and they stopped it. Now, once again, I think that's great, but this is what it looked like. So stopping the road isn't like, there's no point in stopping the road if it's just going to keep looking like this. So Div, I hope you have a plan for turning this into a restaurant or something. But you're definitely going to have to clean it up, because what's the point of not having a road there? Anyway, these are things that I'm sure you'd like to throw tomatoes on me. But I, I would like a good explanation of why that's good. It's been there forever. Nobody even noticed it. And by the way, Divi, I think I mentioned this to you. When I was looking for that step well, I found this one. That happens a lot. This is at another school. The first one is behind, in, behind a girl's school. I couldn't even get into it. And I'm pretty tough about those things. I think it must have been built at the same time. It's that same weird, almost poured concrete looking thing. And it's got four separate entrances. So that's your next project, eBay. What? This one, I don't know what the name, I don't know anything about it. Yeah, these are just some random pictures. This is one I stumbled on because when I go with drivers, I'm usually by myself with a Hindi-speaking driver who starts out thinking I'm completely out of my mind. And then over the course of like a couple days, when they start seeing what I'm looking at, they get interested, and then they start finding them for me. Uh, one of my drivers found this. He said, I remember when I grew up in this area, there was a step well. No information about it. 
This is at Nagor 4, just a very simple one. I love it. In Baroda, you have to have, in Gujarat, you get this very sandy soil, so you have to have these cross braces. You don't get that so much in Delhi because of the rocky soil. But this is just like, you wonder why they even <laughs> built it there if they needed to shore it up like that. This is on the grounds of the uh, Balsamon Palace. It was great. It's not going to be there anymore. This is a very simple step well, but that has this incredible well uh, cylinder with all of these sculptures. It's just, I've never, there's not another one like that. It's beautiful. Kid Brahma, it's in Gujarat. Uh, it's not easy to find, but you can find. If I found it, you can find it. It's not like in a tiny village, it's in a town. But I, believe me, I cannot say anything more than that. It's in Kid which is in Gujarat, and that's as good as you're gonna get from me. But you could find it, it's beautiful. The rest of the step well is, it's protected, and there's just garbage everywhere. Nimrana, which is where I became obsessed. I knew about step wells for 30 years, but this was where I became obsessed. This is only two hours outside of Delhi. If you haven't been, it is truly one of the most spectacular structures ever. You can see it from Google Earth. It's not in any history book. Some random step well I found in Ganarao. No, no, nobody knows a thing about this. Where is it? It's in Ganarao, which is near, it's in Pali district. It's near Nadal. Yeah, I mean, Ganarao is another like kind of small place. I went there, uh, there's a lot of step wells around there. It's near, um, it's near Narle actually, where I was. You, you guys can all tell each other where these are. I just saw these outside of Jaipur. I was looking for them. They're in uh, the area called Gakiguni, which is a fantastic little place if you go to Jaipur on the old highway. Actually, there's now this major tunnel. Um, I don't have any information about them, but I always like to see new ones. And that's a picture I took at Nimrana six years ago when I first, it was right before I fell in love with Stepwells, or maybe right after it. And I was so terrified, I'm still terrified when I go there. It's really dangerous. I was sure I was gonna roll to my death into that. <laughs> I had the driver, I have very few pictures of myself in step wells, because I'm by myself. And so I asked the driver to please take a picture of me because I thought if I die here in Nimrana, I want my son to be able to see me looking happy at the end. <laughs> and that is the end, thank you. Questions, questions, if we have time, it's up to you. I love questions, if they're not hard ones. Yeah, no, no, no. Um, it is uh, at the base of the fort in Nimrana village. It is in the literature, or was, yeah. of the fort. There have been disputes going on for years about ownership, back and forth, back and forth. But it was certainly part of the whole, um, well, actually, I can't even say that because the dates are disputed for that, too. So I guess I would have to say no, but it is in Nimrana village. And at the fort now, you can actually take a zip line that goes. <laughs> what is it? Yeah. We call them zip lines. I would never do that. I would so much rather crawl out onto a ledge in a step well. Any I, other? I have a, a question. Oh, yes. Uh, I was rather intrigued by your. I was rather intrigued by your, the distinction you make between Hindu Baulis and Muslim Baulis. What is your criterion for dividing them like this? Well, for one thing, who built them? These were all built by individual communities, generally mm. for their communities. And it would have been rare for a Hindu community to build a step well for a Muslim community. Um, there's also big differences in the way they're built, as I showed you. Like they were using different types of architectural uh, structures. Right. And I mean, it's like saying, how do you know that Taj Mahal is is a uh, Islamic building. I don't believe that. But anyway, okay. uh, I would like to ask you. For instance, look at Iltutmish's Bauli, the Gandhaki Bauli in Mehroli. 
if you look at the construction, the uh, you know post and lintel, which you're right. suggesting, uh, where does that place it? And uh, it was probably built um, for the village of Mehroli, and we have no real. Uh, I mean, we have no way of knowing whether it was built for Muslims or for Hindus. No, we don't, and that's the earliest step well that you have. have in Delhi, in, yeah. But which leads me to believe that it was probably built for Hindus, because at that time, in around 1200, uh, there were a lot more Hindu structures. But there's no information about that, or Rajon Kibauli, which we know is Muslim, because there's an actual mosque built with it, which pretty much identifies it like that, wouldn't you say? Uh, yeah, I, I, I would, I would, but I would say that again, it may have been built by a Muslim, mm -hmm. but unless we have actual information that Hindus were excluded from it, I'm not sure that we are justified in calling it a Muslim Bauli as such. Any? Well, I mean, <laughs> if it's built by Muslims, I maybe I'm maybe this is a question of definition. Right. If I'm saying it's a Muslim Bauli, I'm saying it was built. By, by a Muslims, Muslim. okay. not this was right. for Muslims. Right, right, right. Because again, okay. the ones that were built in Ahmedabad, those were built by Muslims. The the yeah. three that I showed you, but they were for Hindu use. Right, right. So, so I think this that is just definition semantic. is a, is a yeah. problem. Yeah. No, in the case of Gandaki Bavli, there is always the already the shrine of Kutubuddin Bhakti at Kaki. So there's always a reference to that too. Because there is the shrine and there is the village. And there is always an aspect to that. But you also see, uh, for example, if you're in Hampi, for example, mm -hmm. you find an entirely different take on the step well from the Tibba side. That's, right? you're talking about like the Queen's Bath or one of right. those. Right. When you look yeah. at some of those structures, there is that connectivity which goes back to what you're saying. And invariably, the step wells were done, like you rightly said, in as a means of attaining what would be known as uh, accumulation of good merit. Mm -hmm. So that's, right. that's something that we can all live with. So you usually find the tomb and the step well. So it's saying I'm looking after my needs upwards and I'm looking up I my like needs that. of the people like that. I like so that definition. Yeah. That's nice. Now I have to say that in Hopi that those are not step wells. Those are more like, um, you know, just plain kuns and temple yeah. tanks that you get in the south, which are beautiful. Yeah. But it's, it's a different form. But I think what you're saying, which is the spirit of it, yeah, that would be the same. Thank you. Hello. I, I'd like to know a little bit more about the um, architecture of the step wells in the sense it goes further than the infrastructural needs, no? Like it might be decorated. It, it's not only solving a, a, a water stockage problem. But it goes much farther, right. and in many different shapes and technologies. Can you stay a little bit on that? More well, than I already did. Did you come in late? Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> Forget it. Okay. I'll show you privately, but we already covered that. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> now stick around. I'll literally, I'll show you. That's it. Okay then. Thank you. Thank you. 